Did you know Wheeler was left-handed? No. The whole time I was watching the fifth episode of Night Country, I was sure I was watching Liz Danvers get to where she could reach her turning point and do something that was at least selfless, if not heroic, going into the finale. Not that she was a dark force or anything dramatic like that. More generally abrasive and rough around the edges. As Conley described it in the last episode, she was always good at her job. She's just bad with people. An issue that understandably got worse after she lost a partner and a son. And this week, the remaining connection to that and the person who probably knows her best puts a finer point on it by saying she's not good with people she cares about. So we did see that. After one of her more vulnerable moments where she pleads with Leah to come home for New Year's, she goes to the morgue after learning there'd been nine stillbirths in the villages that winter. The ground is frozen so they can't be buried, and the tiny caskets sit above ground in a room where at least they can keep each other company. This appears to be the last straw because from there she heads to the evidence room to cop some heroin for Otis so that he can lead her to the ice caves. Indirectly, that shifts the focus away from her and on to Pete, the one character who spent the entire season trying to be a good cop. A pursuit he succeeded at week after week, and in this installment he discovered that Silver Sky funded Salal so that they would push bogus numbers to cover up their pollution. Liz was poised to drop this key piece of information like a bomb when she went to meet with Kate, only to have Conley drop one of his own when he tells her he knows the truth about what happened in the Wheeler case. Which, again, came from Pete's good detective work, but also his lousy password management. Hank may be a sad sack who got catfished by a fake Russian bride, but when it comes to work, he only seems like an idiot. This is a fact that has made him useful for Kate, who by the end of the episode, after catching Liz and Navarro lurking around the caves where Annie was killed, once Otis eliminated. That leads to the supreme bad dad move of suicide by cop, when the cop is also your son. At least that's the way I interpreted it. At a point, Hank realizes he won't be able to sway Pete to his side, and from there looks to make an exit by aiming his gun at Liz. In that moment, there isn't a good choice for the younger prior. And while Liz is telling him to think, he has to make a decision. And ultimately, you could argue that he made the good cop choice, but it's not something he'll ever feel good about or ever forget. Also, because of what they're up against in Connolly and Kate, he follows this up with the bad cop move for the right reasons, in the spirit of True Detective, by deciding to cover it up. What sticks with me about this is that at the moment, it feels like a choice between Hank and Danvers. But it's really not. In the end, it's more about Ennis. It's like what Liz said about Annie Kay when they first discussed the case in her kitchen in episode one. Her case was never going to be solved because Ennis killed Annie. And while that was curious at the time, as was the fact that Pete just sort of internalized that and it made sense to him, as we get closer to the end, we get closer to understanding what that meant. After this episode, the fact that the mine is what makes the town viable in the first place seems to support that. They're actively covering up their pollution, which is killing unborn children. That's clear. Kate is willing to go to great lengths to keep that going, which essentially makes her a murderer. And in service of that, she was complicit in moving the body of a protester who died on their land to a place where it would serve as a warning to others. Also crystal clear. But then what really gets her to the point of the direct murder of Otis. And it's always funny in a story like this that clarifying that you're not asking someone to do something illegal is a sure sign you're evil. The thing that got her there is whatever is in that cave where Annie died. What could be hidden there? And how will that explain what happened to the scientists? And whatever is going on with the dead people Navarro is seeing? Those seem like the right questions. While this episode was surprising in the threads it didn't pull on, it did deliver some answers. We skipped ahead a week from Christmas to New Year's, and in that time, the crack forensics team in Anchorage solved the Salal case. It turns out it's not a murder investigation at all. They died from a slab avalanche that, as Conley points out, is a weather event that can account for any of the various things that didn't make sense in that investigation. This is funny because it's a direct reference to the Diatlov Pass incident I talked about in my episode 2 video. In recent years, that's become the official cause of death of the nine Soviet hikers who died under mysterious circumstances in the Ural Mountains in 1959. 
In the Salal case, it's an unsatisfying explanation at best, but one that's convenient for Silver Star, which I already pointed out Liz tries to bring up whenever she gets called to a meeting with Kate. Kavik earned some suspicion last week when the Spiral Rock went missing at his place, but he quickly redeemed himself this week by bringing his buddy Kenny in who could shed some light on the Spiral for Navarro. When he was young, he was taught to fear the Spiral symbol but not for Carcosa-related reasons, but because hunters used it to mark areas with thin ice where you could fall into the underground caves. This made him and the other kids want to crack the ice on purpose so that they could go down and flirt with the Forbidden, and that led to warnings from grandparents that the night country was going to take them. It's all a bit less spooky than expected, and it does sort of explain why Otis might have said what he did in the previous episode, even if his drug-addled brain doesn't remember it, but it also doesn't answer anything about why Annie dreamed about the spiral until she got it tattooed, or what she found in those caves before she was killed. Or, for that matter, Raymond Clark's connection to it, and why whatever they were into was something that they wanted to keep a secret. Another thing that jumped out about this scene, though, was that at the same time he's telling her the story, they're in a public place, they're in the laundromat, Three-Fingered Blair from the Crab Factory shows up to do her laundry. She does a little flyby in the scene, which I have no idea what the implication of that is, but I was glad to see it because it feels like a promise that some of those details we've been keyed in on will pay off. This week they mostly turn towards the real evil force that is the mine, and away from the more supernatural seeming events from the previous two episodes. But Navarro still experienced a couple of small reminders of that in the middle of everything else that was happening. Before things got violent at the protest, she saw a vision of Annie Kay wearing her pink parka in the crowd. At the laundromat before Kavik showed up, she thought she saw a lock of hair inside the washing machine. The episode kicked off with the somber sequence showcasing Julia's cremation. Later, Eve enlisted Rose's help to find a spot on the ice where she could access the sea to spread her ashes. As she's getting up from that, she hears something in the wind that sounds like it's calling to her, and she starts walking. She has a quick vision of the war and then snaps out of it when she hears the sound of the ice cracking under her feet. This terrifies Rose, who can't believe she started walking into the sea like that, but they're able to get her back to safety. This echoes what Navarro was telling Liz in the last episode, that something calls the women in her family and they follow. This is the first time I put it together that all of these visions occur in the exact same location. There was an indication that her vision was from her time serving in the war, so the vehicle flipped over on its side makes you think that her unit had a run-in with an IED. That would explain the vision of the soldier with half their head blown off, and it also creates an atmosphere of a place between life and death. I went back to watch the clips and there aren't any obvious clues. Of course, Holden is dead, and when Lund speaks to her when he looks possessed in the hospital, he says her dead mother is waiting for her. Her final vision comes toward the end of the episode. She's driving and pulls up to a crosswalk where a kid gets kind of creepy and points at her. The show doesn't trust us to remember all the other times we've seen someone pointing in one of her visions and cuts in clips of the Wheeler victim, Lund, and her mother doing it. The kid feels a little out of place compared to the others. And while I can't explain any of this, it makes me think of what Rose said about the different reasons the dead talk to people. And I figure that will be important in the finale. For a quick reminder, she says the dead appear for different reasons. Sometimes they just miss you. Sometimes they need to tell you something you need to hear. And sometimes they want to take you with them. And you need to know the difference. With the soldier, she just hears the word listen. The soldier tells her that. With Holden, she hears that again in the background. And then he says, tell my mommy something that you can't really understand. When she spreads the ashes, she hears her name and a jumble of whispering that you can't make out. Then a voice that sounds the same as the one from the Holden vision says, listen again. And when she snaps into the vision that time, it's silent until she hears the ice cracking. Speaking of that, there were a lot of mentions of thin ice and the idea of falling through it beyond her close encounter here. That's likely foreshadowing one of the main characters going into the ice, which is something that the opening credits have already been hinting at. I complained a little in my last video about the music in the last episode and the series in general, and the last couple of needle drops in this one also nearly took me out of what was happening. But I have to give credit where it's due. The John Hawk song was pretty great. 
Not just the actual song, which I do believe is an original the actor wrote himself and is quite good, but I thought the whole sequence was put together well. I should mention this isn't the first show I thought was using too much music lately, and I hope this won't turn out to be a continuing trend. For me, wall-to-wall music with lyrics makes a show feel like a series of music videos. And those slowed-down, stripped-back versions of the really recognizable tracks may be a great way to save some licensing money, but it's so common right now that it has very little impact. I think it can still work sometimes, but every time another show does this, the chance of it working decreases. So overall, less ghosts, but still some ghosts, and more about the concept of justice. And we're all heading to the night country now. I do appreciate the turn toward justice. There's an infinite amount of interesting situations that can come out of that. It does get tricky when people start to take matters of justice into their own hands. Of course, sometimes it seems necessary, but other times it's not so cut and dry. Poor Pete will be thinking about that forever. And even though the character stuff isn't as effective in a compressed six-episode affair, the show did manage to make me feel something about that. There was that short exchange where Leah warned him not to let Liz ruin that thoughtful high school hockey star who was willing to give up glory to help a friend going through a rough time. And when you think about how everything played out, you realize that there are other forces to consider. It really isn't always about Liz. And I suppose we saw her moving in the direction of getting better with people she cares about before everything went to hell. It's funny because she's an inconsiderate, overbearing boss of nothing else. There's no disputing that. But how low is the bar at the end of this episode? (laughs) I didn't have time to look at too much of what people were saying about this episode because it dropped on Lunar New Year. But I did see someone post, Dads would really rather suicide by son rather than go to therapy, which made me laugh out loud. So kudos for that. I was surprised there were no updates on Oliver Tagak. By the end, we know what the spiral means to the people in the hunting community, though, so we can expect to find him hiding out in the night country as well. And I guess since there's only one episode left, we'll be finding Raymond Clark there. He's managed to evade them for quite a while, but we're going to need to get his side of the story to wrap this thing up. We're almost there. According to the website, the finale is 75 minutes long, so that's a little bit longer than the 60-ish minutes all the other episodes have been. A lot of questions to ponder between now and then. Let me know what you're thinking about the most in the comments, and I think that's a great place to leave things. Please like this video if you enjoyed it. Please subscribe to my channel if you haven't already, and thanks for watching. I'll talk to you soon.